All right, ready to go? Let's talk about stigmatized properties. How many of you believe in ghosts? It's okay to believe in ghosts. I don't disbelieve in ghosts. I haven't seen one, I don't think. But I'm not going to say there aren't any. Who knows, right? But can I prove that? That's the problem. I can't prove that there are. So therefore, if a house that I'm going to sell, if it comes with a story that says there's a ghost in the house, some people are going to be very, very afraid and they're going to run away. Some people are going to be very intrigued and then they're going to be disappointed when they find out there's no really a, not really a ghost here. So we those are that is called a stigmatized property. Was it seriously your first question, Reagan, about ghosts in the house? All right. Um, what about murders in the house? What about deaths in the house? What about crimes in the house? Right? Now, we talk, I, I said earlier that we needed to talk about the house, right? Okay. That's feng shui, right? There's a little bit of uh, no bad energy, right? Everything's got to be positive. Okay. That's fair. For you, that's a comfortable sign. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly okay. But I, anything that happened there, unless it was documented, you'd have to do the history of, right? Your agent shouldn't be giving you that information because you do not have to um, give, as long as they've cleaned up the blood on the walls from the murder scene and they've repaired the walls, it's over, right? So there's no reason for anybody to tell you that that house is not functional. Now, Again, unless you are, you know, unless it bothers you, then everybody's different. You would react in the same way. But the um, the point is that does everybody die in the hospital? Not everybody dies in a hospital. Not everybody dies in an ambulance. Most people die in their own bed. Therefore, there's a lot of houses out there that have bad deaths in them. Yes. My dad passed away in my in the bedroom in his bedroom here. It was a very tragic thing for me, but you know, that's life. That's life. Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, and I mean, again, uh, committed suicide in there. As long as they, you know, people die in their houses. As long as there's no residue in the walls or anything else like that. There's not much you can do about that, all right? People die in houses all the time. So these are called stigmatized properties. And stigmatized properties, you do not have to um, disclose something of that nature. Now, let me share this. Okay, so site of any criminal activity um, or event, death of the occupant or owner, AIDS or HIV. Now. Let's talk about AIDS and HIV. We're going to talk about it today, and then we're not going to talk about it for a while until the next to last class. Back in 1988, the last provision of the federal fair housing laws was made that uh, made it illegal to discriminate based on handicap provision, okay? Handicapping or disability. Well, if you remember back in 1988, some of you probably weren't even born in 1988. Maybe you were just born. You don't remember it. But in 19, early 80s to mid 80s, we were in a huge AIDS, HIV epidemic. And much like COVID at the beginning stages, nobody knew what the heck to do with this. Right? So there were all kinds of stories and there was all kinds of tr things trying to find cures or, or not cures, but how to live with it because there's still not a cure for it. Right. So in 1988, it was written into the fair housing laws that people could not discriminate based on AIDS or HIV in that home. So you as an agent are not even allowed to talk about it. So if somebody comes up to you, if Reagan, you came to me and said, Sam, has anybody ever had AIDS or HIV? I could not disclose that information to you. First of all, I wouldn't compile it, so I wouldn't know it. But second of all, I would say to you, Reagan, you're going to have to ask the owners, I have no idea. Okay, as the broker, that's what I would be, yeah, that's what I'd be faced with. If I gave you that information, I would be in violation of the federal fair housing laws. And that comes with about a $50,000 penalty. So I don't really want to do that. 
right? I'd rather have you talk to that person. Now the homeowner can disclose that whatever they want. The homeowner can disclose whatever. In that particular case, we are, um, you know, I can't do that. Now, any of you, does Raleigh have a ghost tour? Any of you folks familiar with ghost tours? Charlotte probably has one. Big cities always tend to get into these ghost tours. But let's talk about different places. If I am in the middle of, um, if I'm in the middle of downtown Wilmington, and I say that my house has a ghost, it's probably going to scare more people off than, than not. But if I lived in downtown Savannah, Georgia, Gettysburg, um, Atlanta, uh, down St. Augustine, where they have these big ghost tour businesses, if I said my house had a ghost, that might add value to the property, right? Because, man, wouldn't I love to be on the ghost tour? So those are the kind of things where, and neither one of us can prove it, right? And you can watch all of those ghost hunters that you want, right? No, they're not going to prove it, okay? But if it's a good story, it's a good story, right? So depending on your location where you are, it might be a good story. It might not be. All right. It could scare some people off. We have um, we have a, a restaurant down here that actually advertises based on the ghost on the third floor. Um, if you go to down, some of these downtowns in these older buildings, they talk about ghosts in the building. But this one is a fine dining restaurant. I mean, high end, high ticket at restaurant. It's called the Brentwood Inn if you're ever in uh, North Myrtle Beach, all right? Um, if, you, if you're ever in North Myrtle Beach, bring your, bring your MasterCard because it's going to cost you, but they talk about the ghost that lives there. And it's a big, it's, it's a big advertising, right? Ghost is not a material fact, right? That's I'm not. So I can't tell you that, right? What's the physical sis, the situation here, all right? The crime scene has been cleaned up. The owner died years ago, so he's not in here now. So all of those things are done. It does not affect the house, unless. What if there was a meth lab in there? What if there was a meth lab in there? Would I have to disclose that there at one time was a meth lab in there? Yeah, absolutely I would, because that could still be residually in the house. If they were cooking meth or doing whatever it takes to do meth, I'm not familiar with the signs of that. So there's chemical in the house. There is a potential danger for that to happen. If it was a form of meth lab, I would have to disclose that. I would also have to disclose any kind of um, polybutylene piping. Polybutylene piping back in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s, was water piping that they used to put under the house. And what they found was some of this stuff was well contained and was okay, never leaked. But some of it, because of the rushing water and the rushing fluids, literally dissolved the pipes. And it dissolved this polybutylene pipe to the fact that the, there would be no pipe left. It would just be gushing out somewhere into this foundation, into the thing. So even if it's been repaired, if I've ever had a breakage with polybutylene pipes, Okay, if I've ever had a breakage of polybutylene pipes, I need to disclose that. So one of the other things that we also have to talk about, so we have meth labs, polybutylene pipes that, that have leaked. If your polybutylene pipes have never leaked, you don't have to disclose it, but if you've had a leak. The other thing is synthetic stucco. Now, synthetic stucco is that stuff that they used to spray on the houses. Um, there was, some, but it was so good, what was happening was, it was acting, they would, they would they'd blow it on the house. And it was working so hard as a vapor barrier, keep the, keep the water from coming in. Does your house get water from other means? Sometimes it sweats. Sometimes it, you know, you get water from tubs. You run a kitchen, hot kitchen sink, steam. That's all water, right? Water comes in. It comes in through the window frames. It comes in through, oh, yeah, right? Water comes in. Well, what happened was synthetic stucco, stucco 
was sealing the house up so tight that water couldn't get out. So there was no way to evaporate this stuff. So what happened was this would hit, you'd have that synthetic stuff go up against the wall. And behind it, you have the sheathing and you have the studded boards and you have the insulation. Well, all of that stuff was living, all of that moisture was living in the sheathing and, uh, and studded boards and all the insulation. Till ultimately the synthetic stucco fell off the house. If you look at some stucco houses, you'll see like a flat spot where that stucco fell off a house. That's usually the first determination of that. But what happens is even if you take all of that stuff off, can you tell where that water damage is gonna be inside? You literally got to rip the wall apart because the damage is not to the stucco so much. The damage is into the inside of the wall, where the insulation is, where the studs are, where all that. So if you've ever, if you have synthetic stucco, you have to disclose that. Okay, you have to disclose that. So those are the three things: polybutylene pipes, synthetic stucco, and any type of meth lab. Even if it's been replaced, even if it's all been replaced, all of it. You still have to disclose it, okay? Because you don't know what the wood, the rot, and the wood, and the mold, and everything else is, okay? You have to disclose those, all right? Now, anything else? What if it's on a brick foundation? Mm, I don't know of any problem on a brick foundation. I only know about the synthetic stucco on the walls, so I don't see if that is a problem. Um, I could be wrong there, though. Um, so. You know, those are the kind of things, those three in particular that you might get asked about, all right, that, that are in there. So those are things that could come back. Even if you got had all of the synthetic stucco put off, pulled off, you still wouldn't know the extent of the original damage, right? You could be buying something that has a lot of original damage. Um, same thing with polybutylene pipes. You don't know when the next pipe is going to break. Um, and again, same thing with meth lab. So all three of those still are conditions of that house, okay? So... Anyway, so those are stigmatized properties. Those are stigmatized properties. And they are not a material fact by North Carolina law with the exception of those three I just told you. All right, all that stuff, they don't have to tell you. All right, now, caveat emptor, right? Buyer beware. So you wanna go check the, check the house out, check the news reports. You can go to do a LexisNexis report, see if that house was ever in the news, right? Um, is this house the OJ house? Is this where, um, uh, where the murders were, who knows, right? Who knows? We don't know. It doesn't affect the house. It affects the story of the house, but it doesn't affect the house. Remember the four, right? None of it says affects the story of the house. All right, now we talked a little bit about this earlier. Sex offender disclosures. By North Carolina state law, the presence of a sex offender <coughs> is not a material fact. Why? Because what are we concerned about? We are concerned about the house. We are concerned about the property, okay? A sex offender in the neighborhood, not much. And we can disclose, if, we, if somebody questions you, the best thing you can do is disclose that there is a sex offender registry that they should go look at. And they would get even more accurate information if they went to the police station they would have that information at their fingertips. But please don't compile it, don't disclose it, don't share it if you don't have to, All right? Because you end up being wrong and there's too many things that can go on there, all right? You don't want that. It's a headache you don't need. And they're giving you a get out of jail free card simply because they're saying, all right, look, you know, don't say anything. Let them go to, let them go to the source, okay? Let them go to the source. All right. Another thing that you should be very careful of that's not in here and not part of stigmatized properties is schools. Be very, very careful. Send people if they say, oh, is this a good, good school system? Is this a good school system? Greatschools.org. Send them there. Let them make their own decisions. Because if my two kids went to this particular school and they were into science and they had a great science program, that would be fantastic. If your two kids went to school and they were in the music program 
and their music program was non-existent, would that be a great school for your kids? No, right? So let them make their own decisions on what's a good school and what's a not good school. It's called greatschools.org. They can go look at them and make their own decisions. Everybody's different. Every kids are different. They, they different programs, everything else. So whatever the kids are into, whatever you're into, that's up to you to find that out. Okay. All right. Don't give that information out. It's not information that you want to share because if you say it's a great school and the they don't have the programs for their kids. Well, you said it was a great school. How are you gonna make that feel? So a few things that we, um, we also want to look at. We are prohibited from making any kind of false promises. I can't use a promise to entice or, um, you know, in this example, what they say is, hey, look, if you rent this property, if I'm a property manager, if you rent this property, I'll have it all painted and cleaned and perfectly shining before you move in. And then you move in and it hasn't been perfectly clean and shiny or anything else. OK, that's a false promise. And you can be um, held accountable. You can be held accountable. So you want to under promise and over deliver. Right. Say it's good and I'll make it, you know, I'll take care of it and then make it great. Okay? Make it great. So it says licensees are prohibited from making false promises likely to influence, persuade, or induce. All right. An agent promises a prospect an apartment will be painted prior to the occupancy and fails to have the work done. Then this is guilty of making false promises. You can't lie. You have to say what you're going to do and then do what you said you were going to do. Now, this falls under your reasonable skill and care. And this is unworthiness and incompetence, unworthiness and incompetence, right? Being unworthy or incompetent to act as a real estate agent in a manner as to endanger the interests of the public. If I'm giving my client bad information, if I don't disclose, um, if I don't disclose that I, uh, I, know the, um, I know the seller if I'm the buyer's agent, or I've had a relationship with um, you know, somebody who is looking to purchase that house or anything else, all of that stuff. What if I don't know how to fill out a contract? And I gotta tell you that when we got in our next chapter, chapter eight, we're gonna see the, um, uh, we're gonna take a quick brief look at the um, listing agreement. The listing agreement's 15 pages long. And then the sales contract, 16 pages long. And guess who has to have some sort of idea what's in both of those? Not only that, do you have to know it upside down? If you're sitting across the table from somebody, are you going to read it and then turn it around and give it to them and then take it back and read it and get, turn around and give it to them? No. You're going to give it to them and you're going to know what's on upside down. You're going to be able to look at the headlines and say, okay, this is what that means. All right. So we've got to be able to do that. We got to be able to do what's called a comparative market analysis. Okay. If houses are selling, we need to know what houses like kind, uh, like kind houses are selling for. So if we're in a neighborhood and the houses are selling for $250,000 and my buyer sees a house for $300,000, I'm going to have to check and see if that house is worth $300,000 compared to everything else that's sold. Because we can go ahead and get into a contract for 300, but who has the last at bat when we go to sales? Anybody want to take a guess who has the last at bat? Who makes the, the ultimately is the decision maker on the price of the house? Not even the buyer or the seller, believe it or not. Not even the buyer or the seller. It would be a marketplace decision, sure, but who sets that? Who's the bank? There you go. Somebody got it. Shelby got it. The appraiser. If you're going to need a loan, what's the bank going to do? They're going to send the appraiser. And what's the appraiser going to do? He's going to give an opinion of value. Now, if that's where you need a loan and you don't have any extra money, that appraiser's got a lot to say. So let's say, for instance, our $300,000 versus our $250,000. Right, everything's selling for two fifty, and he says, "All right, well, wait a second. I um, this house isn't worth two uh, three hundred. 
it might be worth 265. Well, you can still buy it for 300,000, but you better come up with 20% for the loan and another $35,000. You can come up with the rest of that money. You can, whatever a buyer and seller will agree to, they can pay. The bank is not gonna lend on that though. And the appraiser is gonna come in there and they're gonna say, hey, look, we'll give you X amount of dollars. Now, the bank is going to lend on whatever the purchase price of the house or what the appraiser says, whichever is less, whichever is less. So that appraiser is the home team. They're the one who's got the last at that. So you can, you know, seller can say, yeah, I want a million dollars for my house. The buyer says, yeah, I'll give it to you. And the appraiser says, yeah, 800000 is all you're going to get. Well, Mr. Buyer, unless you got 200000 extra in the bank, you ain't got it. You can't buy it. So you need to be able to figure that out. What's a real price, right? Well, when we do chapter 17, we'll do comparative market analysis and we'll do um, um, we'll do those kind of things where we can figure out houses, prices, all right? So we need to be able to do all those things. And if we don't, if we're not sure of it, we're going to be new agents. Ask for help. Work for somebody. Right, work with somebody. Talk to your broker in charge. They'll help you. They're not going to leave you lay you hanging, right? Because if you get in trouble, who else gets in trouble? Broker in charge, right? They're responsible for you. They don't want to leave you hanging. They want a good agent. Okay. So, as the example here in this slide says, failure to properly fill in those blanks of a real estate contract, or to use contract forms which are legally inadequate. All right, you got to use the most up to date forms, and I'll show you where to find that when we look at the forms. Obviously, we don't want to constitute, uh, conduct improper, fraudulent, or dishonest dealing, okay? Um, breach of the agent's duty to exercise skill, care, and diligence on behalf of the client. Understand this, and we're going to talk about this when we talk, when you read your, um, when you read that license law and rules comments, you're going to see that the real estate commission can do four things to you. They can censure you, which is like a letter of reprimand. Uh, hey, look, don't do this again kind of thing. They can give you a letter of reprimand, which means that seriously, stop. All right, this is going in your, remember in grade school, and oh, that's going to go on your permanent record? Well, this will go in your permanent record, this letter of reprimand, okay? The third one is they can suspend your license for a period of time. And the fourth one is they can revoke your license. Now. Notice I said they, they couldn't find you. The Real Estate Commission cannot find you. However, any violation of the Real Estate Commission laws can be put in front of a judge. Can the judge find you? Oh, yeah. If it's serious enough, can the judge give you a cease and desist? Yes. If you're practicing without a license, can the judge put you in jail? Sure can, sure can. The Real Estate Commission isn't gonna do it, but that um, administrative law judge or what they call an ALJ, they can, they can. So any of this stuff, don't think it's there. There's no get out of jail free card here, right? You're gonna, if you do something bad, if you're of e evil mind, just don't do it. Just don't do it, okay? We don't wanna do this. Those six rules that we talked about at the beginning tonight, those six fiduciary promises, we want to make sure we keep them. We want to make sure we keep them. If I get a document from anybody, we agreed on a contract. We have to deliver signed copies of that contract to the other parties. Now, the law says immediately, and that is the best course of action. However, if something happens that somebody's out of town or whatever, any kind of situation, no later than three days afterwards. No later than three days from the date of execution. So immediately is better, is best, no later than three days later. So if somebody signs a, um, a contract, somebody signs a contract, we have three days to get a hard copy to the other party. What happens in that three days until they receive that con contract? They might change their mind. 
and they don't have a contract. You told them, right? Where's the contract? You got immediately is best. Look, this is 2023 going to be next week, right? Two days from now. We have scans. We have texts. We have, you can use, uh, for those of you who do not have a scanner, go um, download on your cell phone. I don't have a scanner. I don't own one. But if you're familiar with Cam Scanner, it's a free um, scanner that you can put on your phone. I've been using that for, I don't know, 15 years now, for as long as I've known it. It's called Cam Scanner. Wayne is the buyer's agent. I'm the sell, I'm the listing agent. Wayne sends me a contract, says, Sam, here's our offer. Sends me an offer. I look at it. I am representing James. Jane, I go to James. James, so what do you think about this? This is a pretty good offer. What do you say? James looks at it and he says, yeah, man, fantastic. I am going to sign it right now and we are going to accept it. I call back Wayne and I say to Wayne, hey, Wayne, how are you doing? And Wayne says, great, Sam, I'm glad you called. I said, what's going on? Uh, my buyer decided to walk away. Never mind. And I say to Wayne, wait a minute, time out. My seller, James, just accepted this contract. Wayne says, tutty, tutty, man, you should have called me earlier. Do we have a contract? We do not have a contract until I call Wayne back and tell him we have one. Regardless of what James has done and told me he accepted it, we don't have an accepts. We don't have one until I call Wayne, or until I call Wayne and tell him we got it, and tell him we've accepted it. So therefore, this immediacy is pretty important, isn't it? For me to get back to him as quick before James puts the S on his last name, I should be calling Wayne, saying, "Hey, Wayne, guess what? We got it." And as soon as James the ink dries on that contract, I'm going to take. I'm going to scan it and I'm going to send it to you so you got it. Now, I don't care what time it is. I'm pretty sure that if Wayne has just sold a $500,000 house or his buyer has just bought a $500,000 house and it's one o'clock in the morning, do you think he's going to care if he got a, a, an email with a, con a signed contract in there and a text? that said, Wayne, we got a contract? I'm pretty certain he is not gonna care what time it is, right? I certainly wouldn't care what time it was. You wanna call me and tell me we got a sale? You got my number, baby, call me up, right? I'm in. So that's what the, the immediacy is, is so quick. So yes, they give you three days to get information over. Three days is a lifetime. Three days of a lifetime. We have immediacy and we have the means to be immediate. We don't have to do this by Pony Express anymore, right? Like that. Before the S and James Sellers is dry on that ink, I'm calling Wayne, right? I'm calling him saying, hey, we got one. We're in. We like it. And that's it. We'll talk more about contracts later. Okay. So that's why the delivery and speed matter. Delivery and speed matter. Um, yeah, iPhone and Android do already have uh, scanners built in. Um, so yes, you, you use those. Use whatever you're comfortable with. But if you don't have one and you don't know how to use it, and I got to be honest with you, I was using those. I was using Cam, uh, cam Scanner before I. I I was the last guy to to learn how. To, I was I was using a Note three up until 2020. So they were, and then I bought a Note 10 Plus. So I was only missed it by seven generation. It's all good. So I was using my cam scanner. It's what I was comfortable with. I still use it. I still use it, right? So whatever you're comfortable with, just know that they're there. So you don't really need a scanner if you don't want one, but they're there. Copy, scan, whatever. Get it in there, save it, right? Also make sure you get a copy of whatever you got. Make sure you keep a copy. It's going to be important. Disclosure to the principle of compensation from a vendor. 
If you are getting money from a vendor, maybe a new homes builder is giving you an incentive to bring a client, you have to get written permission from the principal, your client, okay? So licensees are prohibited from receiving any form of valuable consideration from a vendor or a supplier of goods without first obtaining written consent of a principal. Your client has to approve, all right? So it says, for example, a property manager receives a kickback from the cleaning company for every unit clean. Um, before they can do that, they have to have written consent of the property owner that they can get the money, okay? We used to have banks that gave, you know, gave little stipends, things of that nature, every time you did it. Home, home warranties, if we sold a home warranty, we used to get 50 bucks for selling the home warranty until that was just basically outlawed as a kickback. We'll talk about RESPA in chapter 15, um, chapter 21, both of those. Real Estate Settlements Procedures Act. Um, her specialist came with a bonus to the bonus agent upon the sale. She disclosed this. Was that mandatory? Yes, that was mandatory. She she got money above and beyond. So any kind of bonus that she got, she would, that was mandatory. She disclosed it. And that's a good incentive for agents. We had some builders that were giving away Disney cruises. If you sold three houses in the course of a year, you got a Disney cruise for seven days at the end of the year. That's pretty righteous, right? I mean, seriously, that's real money. It's not that difficult to do. This is, you know, when we were trying to push houses, they weren't, you know, there was not much incentives when houses were flying off the shelves, but we, when it was tough, they would do anything. You'd be surprised. Golf carts, we'd go out for um, uh, barbecues, they'd have in an open house and they were giving away golf carts. And I'm not talking about like your local club cab. I'm talking about a pretty elaborate golf cart, $12,000, $15,000 golf cart. They would run, do a raffle and give it away. So there, there's money to be made, right? But we just want to make sure that we're making, we don't want our client to think what? That we're doing anything below board, right? We want to keep everything on the up and up. There's no reason to do anything about below board because it's their option. Now, if your client, well, if you, let's say this, if there's a builder incentive out there that says, I'm going to give you $5,000 on top of your commission for every house you sell in this community, and you constantly take your clients to that community, and you won't go anywhere else, or only communities you'll show are ones that are paying you a bonus, yeah, that's not, that's not copacetic, all right? That's not fair to them. Remember, we talked about being loyal to your client, even above what yours is, above your own loyalty. If they want to see something else, they, you've got to have to take them there. Regardless, if, if they want to see a house that pays zero commission and they want to see the house, obedience says you have to show it to them. And you have to do your darndest to sell it for them. Okay. And we'll talk about where you put compensations in a little while. We're ahead of that. All right. So again, we have to we have to disclose that. Licensees are prohibited from receiving any form of valuable consideration for recommending, procuring, or arranging for services without full disclosure to such parties. Home warranty referral fees, an attorney, um, a uh, property inspector. If they're paying me for for me to refer them, I need to let the um, let my client know. Okay, we're not allowed to do that. Okay. We're prohibited from valuable concern. The real estate commission really under they do understand. At the end of the year, an attorney gives you a bottle of wine for, for the year. Um, you know, something from up to 50 bucks. You get a gift card from a, a builder or something like that for you know for the course of the year, whatever. The 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 real estate commission says that's nominal, that's a gift. Don't we're not worried about that. If your builder gives you Super Bowl tickets, that is a compensation that you have to disclose, all right? That's compensation you have to disclose. But they're acceptable. I can accept $50 gift cards, a bottle of wine, you know, anything else like that. Um, you, a lot of times they will, they'll have uh, Christmas parties and they'll invite a few, of the, uh, a few of the agents to the Christmas parties and they'll pick up the bar tab and You'll drink and eat pretty good that night. Be like a little party. So none of, none of that thing comes back to it. So again, they say that $50, 25 to $50 are nominal and they're acceptable. 
Disciplinary action, liabilities and consequences of breach of agent duty. If you breach one of those six covenants, you can get disciplined by the Real Estate Commission. All right. You can have civil action brought against you by the injured party. All right. Remember, I talked about criminal, criminal prosecution. We just went through all this, right, by the district attorney. Fraud, um, you know, malfeasance of any type, right? Any misappropriations, things of that nature, okay? Right. And you can also face civil liability due to the agent's misconduct. Civil liability means that that client is going to sue you, in addition to the Real Estate Commission and the criminal prosecution. All right. So we have to be on the up and up. We really need to pay attention to this. So we just talked about all of our obligations here. What are some of their obligations? So we have the dude, they have your principal, the person doing the hiring. They have to act in good faith, right? If somebody wants to buy a house, then we got to go see houses, don't we? We have to make sure that they're willing to go see different houses. We have to wait, make sure they're willing to um, tell us terms. What, what can they afford? What, what are they qualified for? If they're going to pay cash, let me see the money in the bank, right? Um, threshold of guilt lower in civil suits. Um, yes, probably. Um, yeah, it's just uh, we don't have to have reasonable doubt here. We just have to have a preponderance of the evidence. Right. So that would be, yeah, it's, you're going to be, you're going to end up paying. Oh, by the way, when you do go to those kind of courts for those kind of things, um, when you go in front, you're still a big bad company versus some, you know, some lady who spent her last dime crying. I have no more money left and they made me buy this house. Right. And please don't tell me that emotion doesn't play in court. If it, if it didn't play, I can promise you they wouldn't do it. It plays. Right. Um, I used to do just to go a little bit about my background. I used to do investigations for um, for a company when we caught um, people stealing, and I used to do the investigations. And every time we went to court, and we used to have to go in front of arbitration boards. Every time I went to court, the person who we were charging always had his baby, if he had a baby. They were sitting in the waiting room. The wife was sitting in the waiting room, all in tears, all cuddled up, all sitting on the same 42-inch um, love seat so that they can get close. So that when the attorneys came in here, they, you know, everybody could see them. They felt bad for them. And you walk in with a team of lawyers. So there's it's a pretty big game. It's a pretty big game, right? Tyler used to do that too. It's kind of it's it's craziness. Um, so it's a show. And again. If the judge had a good lunch or the arbitrator had a good lunch, you're in shape. If, the, if he didn't, you might not, right? Yeah, okay, there you go. The reason enough, right? So um, you do these investigations. And has anybody ever been cross-examined? Tyler has, right? Uh, okay, there you go. So you have been cross-examined, my friend. Um, cross-examination is not a fun place to be. At the end of a four-hour cross-examination, which was pretty, pretty standard, you were you felt like you were going to have a Perry Mason moment and say, "All right, I just want to get out of here. I did it. Let me go. Right? And forget about him. I was just, listen. You got to know your stuff. So yeah, and I've been through three and four-hour ones and under a, literally a spotlight. Um, yeah, they they try to get you to melt, and you got you got to know your stuff. So if you're the broker and you did something, understand that there's cross-examination. Not a fun place to be. Not your best day. Not your best day. Even if you win, it's not your best day. You just want to get out of it. Um, so we have duties to, um, they ha uh, the principal has duties to act in good faith to us. They have duties to pay us. We're going to talk about in the contracts where this compensation comes. All right. They have to pay us. They have to, um, the sellers, they can say nothing about the house, but if they lie, they're liable for fraudulent misrepresentation. OK, it's best to say nothing than to say the wrong thing or say it's something that would be um, fraudulent. And they can have liabilities and consequences for breach of duty. If you get into a contract, we could talk about specific performance, which we will when we get into um, 
a little bit more about all of these things. If you like this video, feel free to share it with a friend. For more real estate education content, please subscribe to the channel. From all of us at Seacoast Real Estate Academy, thank you for watching.